One of my favorite trimmer brands is Echo, but I've never really wanted to pay the money for a brand new one, not because I didn't think they were worth it, I just don't like spending money. The next best choice is to buy a used one, but even then, they're still a pretty penny. The last option is to buy or find one of the older ones, but then you run into another issue. The reason it's cheap or being given away is that more than likely, it doesn't work like it should. What's up everyone and thank you for stopping by. Today's project is this Echo Trimmer and the problem is I don't know anything about it because I don't remember where I got this one from. It's been in my storage for several years and I've forgotten about it. I think I have an idea where I got it from but I have no way of confirming it. It really doesn't matter. We're still going to inspect it and see if we can get it working again. I'm going to try and repair this trimmer, however, it may not be the exact repair you need to make to yours. We'll explore other options later in the video. Now, we're only going to mention what these other options could be. We don't have enough time to look into them, but if you need more information on these options, you're welcome to ask as many questions as you need to. The first thing I want to do is take a look around and see what kind of condition it's in. And besides a broken purge bulb, the trimmer looks to be in really good shape. After that, I want to make sure the engine isn't stuck, so I'll pull on the rope a few times and see if it spins over freely. Now that I know the engine isn't stuck, I'm going to spray some fuel into the carb's throat, pull on the rope a few times, and see if it'll start and run for a few seconds. <laughs> Well, that has to be the most abrupt test I think I've ever seen. Most of the time, I have to pull the rope a few times, and then it'll run for a few seconds. This one was one pull, and then it ran exactly for one second. Even though it started confirming that we do have spark and enough compression from the engine, I still want to do a compression test to see how worn out the engine is. This might explain why it ran the way it did. <laughs> Now, a good reading would be something well over 140 PSI, but ours looks to be slightly over 75, which is not very good. Now, that might explain why it ran the way it did, but I can't be sure till we get it working again. I have seen engines run with lower readings, but anything below 50 typically means something is wrong with the engine. The next thing I want to do is put some fuel into the tank and see if we can get the engine to start and run on its own. Now the good news is that it starts and runs, but the bad news is it doesn't want to stay running. However, the test runs did show us that the engine stays running when the carb is choked, which basically gives the engine more fuel than air. That means we could get away with tuning the carb to deliver more fuel, or the better option would be to remove the carb for an inspection, then we'll know that we're not compensating for an issue inside the carb. Well, it looks like the return line is split near the port on the carb, so I think I'm going to remove the lines to inspect them as well. Even though these lines don't look terrible, we might have to replace them so we don't have to worry about them in the future. Now, for those of you who don't know what the third fuel line is for, it's the tank vent to allow air to displace the fuel in the tank. If this part fails, then fuel won't leave the tank and make its way to the carb. In other machines, this part is built into the fuel cap, but if you look at this one, there isn't a hole in the cap to allow air into the tank. Now, if your engine runs for about two minutes and then stops, the vent might not be working like it should. The first part I like to remove is the pumping section. This is just a personal preference of mine. You can take it apart however you like. Now once the purge bulb is removed, you'll then need to remove a screw that holds the pump to the rest of the carb. Since I know this carb does work, I'm not interested in looking at the pumping diaphragm. Although I am interested on whether the inlet screen is clogged with debris, but as you can see, it doesn't have anything on it, so there's nothing restricting the fuel flow through the carb. The next part I want to take off is the metal plate so we can inspect the metering diaphragm. Once the plate is off, we can see the metering diaphragm, and I'm glad to say it's still very flexible and doesn't show any signs of hardening. It should still work fine, but there are a few wrinkles in it, and even though this probably isn't going to hurt anything, and since we're here, I'm going to replace it anyway. 
Before I replace the metering diaphragm, I'm going to put some fuel on the inlet screen to see if it will flow through it. If fuel does not flow through the screen, then I'm going to have to remove the screen so I can clean it. Now the first time I pressed the rocker arm, the fuel didn't flow through the screen, but on the second press, it finally flowed through it. Now that was a bit strange, so I'm going to do the same test again and see if it improves. As you can see, it worked out much better this time. That means I can finally move on to the next part. Now for the longest time, I didn't think these carbs were adjustable, but it turns out the screws were just hidden. This black plug is covering the L screw, so to remove it, I'm going to heat up a small drill bit to help me get it out. I'm sure there are better ways to do it, but this is the way I prefer. Now once the drill bit is hot, I'm going to press it against the plug and then give it a quarter turn. I'll then wait for a minute or so for the drill bit to cool, allowing the plastic to melt around the flutes on the drill bit. I'll then turn the drill bit in the same direction I initially turned it. At the same time, I'll pull on the drill bit. Once it's out, you should be able to see a slotted brass screw under the cap. Now the H screw is hidden with another cap in the middle of this hole on top of the carb. For this one, I'll use the same drill bit and drill into it until it grabs the cap. Now do this at your own risk because you could easily damage your carb. The slot for the H screw is very hard to see on camera, but it's about half an inch down in the hole. Once these are gone, I'll begin to reassemble the carb. So here's the metering diaphragm I'll be using for this carb, and the most important part is that the stem in the middle is the same size as the one you're replacing. Now the stems can either be long or short, and this one happens to be the shorter one. If you're interested in getting one of these for your carb, there should be a link in the description for this video. Now, when replacing the diaphragm, make sure the gasket is installed first, followed by the diaphragm, then we can replace the metal plate over it. If you don't want to go through the hassle of servicing a carb or you've cleaned one already and it still doesn't run correctly, the other option would be to simply replace it. Before replacing the pumping section, I'm going to replace the purge bulb. Now these are very affordable, so buying a kit that contains more than one bulb is a good idea. If you need to buy a bulb and you're not sure which one you need, there should be a link in the description to a purge bulb variety pack that should cover most of your needs. Before reinstalling the car but back on the engine, I'm going to quickly replace the fuel lines. Now you're probably going to disagree with me, but I'm only going to be changing two of the fuel lines, which is something I don't normally do. The reasoning is very simple. The two lines I'll be replacing have fuel moving through them, while the third line is a vent line which doesn't have fuel moving through it. Also, the hose for the vent is still in pretty good condition, so that's why I'm not going to replace it. So if the lines are in usable condition, why change them out? The reason is so you don't have to worry about them in the future. Now these lines aren't that difficult to replace, so we could have just waited until they really needed to be changed out, but I'd like to get it done all in one sitting. Now once the lines have been replaced, I'll then reinstall them back in the fuel tank and then reseat the fuel tank grommet. Once the fuel lines and grommet have been installed, there is a place for the tank vent to sit to protect it, so it's a good idea to make sure to place it there. One last thing before we install the carb, and it's more of an OCD issue, is that the fuel lines are turned opposite from how they should be on the carb, so I'm going to rotate the grommet so the lines won't have to cross each other when connected to the carb. Now the outer fuel line is right under the port for the return, which is what this fuel line is set up for, and the inner fuel line is right under the port for the fuel supply from the tank, which is the fuel line the filter is connected to. Now this line will connect to the larger of the two ports on the carb. Of course, that means the return line will then connect to the smaller port. Once the lines have been installed, we can now install the carb to the engine. So another option as to why this engine might not be running is that there's an air leak at a seal or a gasket on the engine. Now this would interfere with the air that's going through the car but where the fuel is being delivered and causing the engine not to get enough fuel to stay running. The fix is quite difficult because you have to find the leak and then repair it. Once the carb is back on the engine, I'm going to put some fuel into the tank and then try starting it. Now what I would normally do would be to press the purge bulb to take all the air out of the fuel system, but this time I'm going to do something a little bit different. I want to prove that you don't need to have a working purge bulb to get air out of the fuel system. What I'm going to do is pull the starter rope several times, which will then draw fuel from the tank and into the carb. Now this will only work if the carb is in working order. If the carb has an issue internally, this will not work. Turns out it's really hard to film fuel moving up the fuel line while pulling on the rope, but here's a shot of the fuel lines side by side. If you look at the picture on the right, the fuel line doesn't have the reflections that the left picture has. That means fuel did flow up to the car, but so that means we should be ready to start it.
So it tried to start while it's fully choked, but it didn't do anything while partially choked. Let's do that again and see if we get a different result. So we just confirmed that it does start while fully choked and dies when it's not. That means the engine wants more fuel to stay running, and that means we need to make a few adjustments to it. Luckily the screws are not special, but you will need a small flathead to turn the screws. I'm going to start by turning the L screw, which adjusts fuel delivery when idling counterclockwise to give the engine more fuel, and I'm going to start with a quarter turn. Now just for some added insurance, I'm going to press the purge bulb a few times as well. As you can see, after the first press of the bulb, some fuel started to fill the bulb, which means the carb did have fuel in it already. So after the adjustment, it was a little bit better, it tried to start while fully choked and ran while partially choked. I don't want to make another adjustment just yet because I want to give it another try. Besides, I might have moved the choke lever to the run position before the engine had a chance to warm up. So I stopped the engine because the trimmer head isn't spinning when I squeeze the throttle. Now the most likely problem is a broken drive shaft or one that's not engaged on the head or near the engine. That's when I notice the mark on the shaft is too far away from the cover so I'm going to move it closer to the engine and see if that fixes our problem. So it looks like that fixed the problem and the engine seems to be running much better as well. Now we adjusted the L screw to get the engine to keep from dying, but what about the H screw? Well I did try to adjust it, but it turns out it was already set to where it needed to be, so I didn't bother including it in the video. So how much money did I spend on this repair? Well I used about a dollar's worth of fuel line and the metering diaphragm was bought in bulk so it was only a dollar as well and the purge bulb was also bought in bulk so it only cost me 10 cents. That means this repair cost me two dollars and 10 cents and it took me two hours to film and fix it. So my question is, do you think it was worth fixing an older Echo trimmer versus buying a used current model? Personally I think the better deal was to fix the older one. Thank you for watching. I really do appreciate your time here. Please feel free to ask me any questions, and I hope to see you in the next video.